you set up properly, your head is going to be directly in the middle of the feet. That makes the shoulder square. If your head favors the left foot, let's say you've got a very dominant right eye. Let's say that ball's way up in your stance. You don't chase it with your head. You put the head directly in the middle. If your left eye dominant, you don't put the head back, okay? Because now we're not square. The third, the elbows, that's the hardest one. And the reason being is because our arms are the same length. So if we could grip the putter with our hands side by side, our elbows would be in the perfect position. Okay? That way every time we made the stroke, this ball is going to be on the line. But we don't do that. In a conventional grip, the right arm is underneath, and the farther it gets underneath, the higher that arm gets. When that arm gets up too high, what's going to happen to the putter as you take it away? It's going to go outside. Left hand low players generally have a very high left arm position. What do you think their putter likes to do? Likes to go out to the right. Okay? We used to teach them a grip in putting called the reverse overlap. Put your left hand on, lift your, your finger, lift your forward finger. Take the right hand, slide it down against the left hand like this, and then take that index finger and just lap it over, just like that. That's been the putting stroke for well over 100 years. Tour players don't use this grip. What they've done is they've taken the little finger of the right hand and they've moved it down one slot like that. Now what that does, it brings the, the elbows closer together. They're more balanced there. The ball's going to have a better line to it. If you look at a club, pro, a club player left hand low, you're going to see 10 fingers. On the tour, not only do they take one finger down, they take two. Except for pure Jerks three. So what you what we know now is that the best putters are trying to get their hands closer together. Okay? The closer your hands get together, the more balanced you are across the elbows. The more balanced you are across the elbows, the better your line is going to be. Okay? Any questions on that? The four lines are really, really important. But I want you to notice, a lot of players like to stand with their feet in an open position. Okay? Their knees, their hips might be in an open position. But the eyes, shoulders, and elbows are all square to their intended line. Okay? So if you've got a player that's a little open or a little closed, you don't have to worry too much about it. As long as the top three lines are Square. The putting stroke has a plane. And that plane is from the ball over the shoulder. Just like that. Now, if you stay on the plane with your putting stroke, on the back swing, the left shoulder will go right down that plane line. On the forward stroke, it will go right up that plane line. Watch Matt as he does this. See that left shoulder go straight up? We know his putter is going to be on mine. This is Harris English. Okay? Again, he sets up. His plane line is in place. Watch his shoulder. Right on line. One of the biggest mistakes you're going to see as an instructor is you're going to see a player that as they start their forward stroke, this left shoulder pulls off that plane line. When this shoulder pulls off the plane line, where's the putter going to go? 
it's going to reroute to the left. Okay? High handicappers, when their left shoulder comes off the plane line, they always pull it. So if you get a student that comes to you and he says, well, you know, what's the biggest issue you have? Oh, I pull everything. Lesson's over. You know exactly what you need to do. Okay? So all you got to do is get that left shoulder working up. That keeps you on plane. If you're a high handicapper and your left shoulder comes off the line, sometimes you're going to feel that. You feel the fact that that putter wants to go down. So what are you going to do? You're going to shove. Uh, a low handicap player creates a two-weight miss with their plane, where a high handicapper really only has one weight miss. One thing to look for, if this shoulder comes off my plane line, what does my head do? It has to move forward. It has to move forward. If you see a player who moves the head forward, the reason it moved forward was that the plane line was uh, left. A player will tell you, boy, I have a problem with short putts. Boy, I, I, I just miss a lot of short putts. What did he just tell you? Yeah, when you get in here, that cup's right there. You get that putter back. You want to watch that. You want to kind of see it roll in. Well, what just happened? Left shoulder just came off plane. How many are going to miss it left or miss it right? Okay. I love when people tell me what's wrong with this. They're pretty good at it. <laughs> Okay, I want to take it back a little bit. I want to talk about the evolution of the putting stroke. The putting stroke is probably the part of the game that's changed the most in the last 70 years. Prior to 1965, the putting stroke was nothing more than just a flick of the wrist. Okay? Videos of Bobby Jones and Gene Sarris, Ben Hogue and Sam Snead, Arnold Palmer, Billy Casper. Very, very risky. Keep in mind that the putting surfaces that they putted on were more like our fringes today. They needed to find a way to add loft to their putter to get that ball up and rolling. Right around 1965, the Greens were getting a little better. The best putters in the world started to eliminate these small muscles. They started to use bigger muscles. Think about Arnold Palmer for just a second. Arnold Palmer would get down here and all ribs, right? Jack Nicklaus came along, left arms out. As he went back, right arm separated. Left arm stayed out here. But his hands were very passive. In that time period, we had Lee Trevino, Raymond Fulton, Jordan Archer, Lanny Watkins, Ben Crenshaw, Tom Kite, all very much arm putters. Didn't last long. 1996, we started to see a brand new putting stroke coming to the tour. It was a putty stroke brought to the tour by these young players who had grown up on better putty surfaces. <clears throat> the stroke that they brought with them utilized the even bigger muscles in the body, the upper back, the shoulders, the upper chest. Literally, these players lock the arms into the body, and any movement of their putter is a direct result of what these big muscles are doing. Not what the arms are doing, not, especially not what the hands are doing. Now, to measure your students' use of their big muscles, at a dress, I draw a line right across the top of the shoulders. I draw another line right up the shaft of their putter. As you can see here, that uh, inside angle between the shoulders and the shaft of the putter is 75 degrees. That's a good number. 
all four players stand uh, 75 to 85 degrees, shoulder tip. Okay. Now, if they're at 75 at a dress, you want them to stay within two degrees of that start position throughout the stroke. So we take it to the end of the back swing. We draw a line up the shaft of the putter, across the top of the shoulder. Now they're at 73 degrees. That's within two. So that's telling you that the back swing was big muscle. That was a big muscle takeaway. What would happen if this was 65? You would be all arms. Now we go to the end of the stroke. We draw a line up the shaft of the putter, across the top of the shoulder. We measure the inside angle. He's at 76, which is within one of 75. That's a very good putting stroke. That's why he had such a good year this year. Okay? I tell my students, I say, you know, when you set up, your sternum looks at the putter head. All during the stroke, that should Continue that the feet. That'll keep them square. Okay. Based on a spine angle that's between 120 and 135 degrees, and an arm angle that is under, I'm sorry, arm angle between 120 and 135, and a spine angle between 113 to 123, the putting stroke has 105, 103 to 105 degree radius. It has an 18 degree arc. And that's what it looks like right there. Player takes the putter back. This is a tour player, you can see. They pretty much stay right on that line right there. This is a, an amateur player. Now, first off, you notice the putter dropped down. See right here? And then it went above the line. Tell me what happened right there. Standing too tall. So the first thing, the shoulders turned too flat, which makes the putter come inside. And then the player corrected it by lifting the right arm. Okay, and now you get this kind of an S looking stroke right here. All right, from the end of the backswing back to the ball. You can see that the tour player's forward stroke and backswing are right on top of each other. All of that is that's your connection and staying connected using the big muscles. Whereas what happened here? Once, once we got this move and that right arm came away from the body, it stayed away. So when they started forward, now they have an over-the-top loop. Okay. And then the finish. Okay. You can see the tour player has just stayed right on that line. The average player here, he's, he's going left. Look how close the club face is. That closed club face comes from right there. When he lifted that right arm, he never got that right arm back. And it stayed out there, and it just shut everything down. Look how much longer the follow-through is with the average player than the tour player. Now, I want to tell you something right now. My last uh, research project last year was on speed control. Um, found out that every player on the tour has a tilt at the start. You just draw a line right across the top of the shoulders and then a horizontal line. <coughs> Every player on the tour has a start shoulder tilt between 9 and 11 degrees. They have a finish position between 19 and 21 degrees. Every player. We also know that every player, when they finish the stroke, no matter how long this putt is, they finish their stroke eight inches outside of the out, the outside of the left foot. That's the follow-through for a tour player, right there. 
If it's a three footer, they're gonna take it back very little, but they're gonna finish at eight inches. If it's a 50 foot pot, they're gonna take it back farther, but they're gonna finish at eight inches. Raymond Floyd told me one time that when he gets under pressure, he, he had this thing that he used, he said he would hit and stop. Hit and stop, he said, because under pressure, your forward swing tends to get way too long. Okay, and then you lose control of the pot. So you can see right here how that, that uh, follow through was a little shorter. Okay, well, let's talk about results. Now we're going to jump out of the mechanics just for a second. And we're going to look at the results. Remember, the only thing different between a good butter and a great butter, great butter makes more putts. The first thing you have to do in order to be a great putter, you've got to, you've got to be able to turn that ball end over end. Okay? If you can't do that, you got to, you've got to go back to your mechanics and work on your mechanics until you can. Here's the reason. You've got a 15-foot putt that breaks 15 inches right to left. You hit the ball, it comes off your putter spinning clockwise. That ball, the break of the ball is going to be reduced by 50%. You're going to miss that putt seven inches high. But what happens? You start thinking about a little read. All right, same putt, 15 feet, 15 inch break, your ball comes off counterclockwise. It's going to break 20 and a half inches. You're going to miss it seven inches left. You're going to think, well, I didn't read enough break. It had nothing to do with the read. It had everything to do with the roll of the ball. Okay? So what I like players to do is to start at four feet with the strike ball and then see if they can hit this putt and make that ball turn end over end. If they can, I'll back them up to eight feet, see if they can still do it. Okay. The second thing that you need to do, right? Now, even if the ball has curve to it, if you hit it end over end, it will stay end over end. Okay? Because the ball moves with the break. The second thing is you've got to keep the ball on the ground. You can't be launching the ball and expect it to do what you think it's going to do. It won't. Okay? Here's the tour player's stroke right here. Now, the, his rise angle at impact was seven tenths of one degree down. That's changed a lot in the last 50, 60 years. We used to be taught keep the putter as low as possible and hit up on it. Well, that's a great stroke when the green's about this long. Okay? But with today's greens, the best putters putt up to down. They hit slightly down or level. But, so, he's got a seven tenths of one degree down rise angle. The shaft of his putter was leaning forward one degree. He had a, a four degrees of loft on the putter, which gave him a, an effective loft of three. So you take the three degrees, you add in the seven tenths down, his predicted loft was 2.3. Not too bad. Now we've got the amber. Look how that amber, look how he stays low going back. And then that, that part takes off. Okay? Well, first thing, he had a rise angle of one degree up. The shaft angle was tilted back four and a half degrees with three degrees of loft, which gave him an effective loft of seven and a half degrees. You add in the rise angle, his predicted launch is 6.2. Okay? It's going to be a few feet before his ball gets on the ground and starts rolling. Okay? So keep that ball on the ground. For players that are like that, that you don't really see them, you know, call it releasing it, but they still have real high rise and 
Yeah, it doesn't really seem to fall oh, back. The amateur player? Yeah, the amateur player. Oh, the amateur player can. He can break down. Well, I'm just saying, let's just say he does it. He can, yeah, yeah, he can pull out of it. There's a lot of things. Do you, you put forward press into that player to try to help keep that thing lower, or do you just work on trying to go high or low? I don't know. But I do what I do. I take uh, two inches behind the back of the car. I put a quarter. Two more inches, I'll put two quarters on top of each other. And then have them pop without hitting the floor. Okay. Sure. Um, how does um, the stroke, stroke in a, a ball versus pop? It looks like a lot of times they're popping the ball. You know, people um, came to me for years and they said, I was watching the tour this week. It looks like they hit the stop. I said, I said nah, that doesn't happen. You know what? It does. <laughs> It does. Every putt finishes eight inches outside the left foot. So if you've got a 30 footer and you take that putter back, it comes in and there's your stop right there. Yeah. But does that affect the roll? No, not at all. The only thing that will affect the roll is one, the face angle or the path. Okay? But if your face angle and path is good, this time you're rolling in no ring. What, what about a guy like Phil Moose and how would he putt? How does his style fit in today? I've never worked with Phil. I've, I've looked at his stroke and I really haven't paid attention to it. And as we know, I mean, from 15 feet, he is he really one of the best. But he missed so many inside of six feet. So I don't, I don't really know why. I really haven't even taken a look at that. <coughs> I worked with Tiger Woods from 1996 to 2008, 12 years. Um, so that's why it's the best for five So that's why it's the best for five people. Oh, without that. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I'll tell you about Tiger, he may be a, a fitness nut, and he is, really. But he is a cheeseburger freak. Okay. You can come to my house once once a week, and I call him and I say, Tiger, what do you want to eat tonight? He said, cheeseburger. <laughs> so my wife taught him how to cook. So she would pat him out, put him on the plate, start the grill. He'd come through the front door, pick up the plate, go cook for us. <laughs> so, we had a lot of fun with him. He, he was something. Anytime Tiger got off in putting, it was as simple. He would start to lose his spine angle. Huh? Because he started. He would start to stand up. His arms would start to get long, and his back swing would get loose. In 2008, uh, Sean Foley gave him an exclusive contract. He couldn't work with anybody else. Tiger called me and said, "If I sign this." can't work with it. I said, Tiger, we've been working together for 12 years. If you haven't got it by now, you probably won't. <coughs> but I said, look, I've known Sean since he first got in the golf business. I said, if you really need some help, we'll talk to Sean. You pick him up in your jet, bring him up to Sea Island. I'll meet you there. We'll go out to the end to the back of the range. We'll do our work, take you back to there, or nobody will ever know that you guys have been in, in town. So he signs it, three weeks later, misses his first cut in 180 starts. Now at the row. And the next week I got some video clips of Tiger Putty. Well, of course, I drew the lines. And uh, I knew exactly what it was. Standing up too tall, arms too long, putty stroke too loose. Two weeks later, we're at Bay Hill. And I'm working with Matt Kuchar, and Sean Foley comes on to the putting range. So I go over, because I really thought Sean was doing a good job with his full swing. So I congratulated him on his work with uh, Tiger. And Sean says, well, look, have you seen Tiger putt? I said, well, it just so happens, I got some video last week of Tiger putt. I don't know if you sent it to me. He said, did you look at it? And I said, of course I looked at it. He said, what did you see? So it's the same thing that we've seen for 12 years. 
was standing too tall, his arms were too long, and his buddy was throwing his two boots. Friday night, Tiger's got a five shot lead. The Golf Channel is all over the fact that Sean Foley has told Tiger, don't bring your bed and tighten up his throat. <laughs> so, I didn't see Sean until the uh, um, PGA Championship was at uh, the Ocean Course at Kiel. Flavorism. <laughs> oh, I was working with Graham McDowell, and Sean and Doug were right behind me. So I turned around and said, hey, Sean. I said, do you remember Bay Hill? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, you got me, didn't you? He said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and that just shows that everybody can have issues. All right. If, if there's a mess pot, if your student messes a pot, or you mess a pot, you know, I ask this question, the tour players, they look at me, and they say, well, I, I guess I made a bad stroke. No, not really. The first thing you want to ask yourself is, did that ball turn over as you intended it to? Yes or no? If it did, that just means the club face was squared and the path was good, which means that's a perfect putting stroke. But it didn't go in. Perfect strokes don't always go in the path. Two, was the speed correct? I'm a big believer that every player has a certain speed that if they're putting at that speed, they're going to maximize the number of putts that they make. Tiger Woods was a very aggressive putter. Yes, sir. What's your idea on the speed? My idea is your putting speed depends on your personality. I think the more driven your personality is, the more aggressive you're going to be. I think if, you, if you're a laid-back type of personality, you're going to be one to drop it over the front end. But I think everybody has their own. And I, I like that question right there. Uh, Tiger Woods, when he misses the putt, it would go three to three and a half feet past. Justin Thomas prefers to drop his ball over the front edge. Right? They're both great putters. Was Tiger Woods listening to Dave Pence a little too much? I don't even know if he ever listened to it. <laughs> but those two, they're probably as far apart in speed as you can get. If they decided to switch speeds, neither would make very many bucks. Right? Because when they, they've done this for so long, when they read the brain of the putt, their brain automatically factors in their speed. Right? So let's just assume that your student's best speed is two feet past. And he hits a putt at three feet past. He's going to miss the putt. He's going to miss it just off the high level. He hits the next putt one foot past. He's going to miss just on the low level. Okay? So you've got to be able to control that speed whatever your speed is. And then the third thing is, did you read it correctly? Okay. If you ask yourself, or your student asks themselves these three questions, within a week, a pattern starts to show itself. And that's the reason why they don't make the putts that they should. Maybe they have a problem turning the ball over. Well, now we need to go back and work with their mechanics. Maybe they just don't hit it the right speed. They're inconsistent with their speed. We all have a number of drills to help a player with the control of their speed. And then the third, well, if the first two are good and they miss, well, they're just misreading. We'll talk about that outside. All right, free stroke flaws. Inaccurate reading, miscalculated distance, disaim, which means the ball position is a little off. Body, not square to the intended line, no connection, or inconsistent free cross routine. In stroke flaws, once that putter's in motion, what can go wrong is the arms become disconnected. You're off plane. Too much putter rotation, too little putter rotation.
transportation. Okay? Control issues, speed control issues, length control issues. Or how many times we get in the middle of that stroke and we change our mind and we try to manipulate it. Okay? Happens all the time. On too much or too little, a while ago you mentioned 18 degrees of rotation. That's nine on one side and nine on the other. Okay. As balanced as you can get it. Uh, I like to see them stay within the one or two on that. <clears throat> These are normally the players that have an issue with the elbows. Okay? The average collegiate player that we see has a total face rotation between 20 and 24, and the tour players are between 6 and 12. That's really one of the biggest differences between a collegiate player and a tour player. Now, the other part can be the putter. If you've got a player who's, who's putting at 15 degrees total rotation and he's got 60 degrees of toe hang, if you can reduce that to 30 degree toe hang or even a face balance putter, then he's going to fall right, right in there. Ah! You see this right here? See the little shaded area around? See how all five strokes stay within that? That's a very good putting stroke. There's the yips. Okay? Anytime you see this stroke above the shaded area, the face is open. Anytime it's below, it's closed. Let's look at this blue one. Alright? It goes down, back to the left, down again, up, down. That means when he comes through the ball, his hands are doing this. Okay. I was very fortunate when I first got to see Alan. Uh, I had a call one day from a doctor at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. And they, he informed me there was a group of doctors that play golf together a lot. And they decided they wanted to do a project on the yips to see if there was anything medically that could be done. Wasn't know if I wanted to be a part of it. Man, yes. So, we had 65 players who had the yips. Now some players came in, they didn't really have the yips. They thought they did, but they didn't. We had 65 yippers. We had one man, believe it or not, at impact, his feet were one inch off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> He's <laughs> We found out in every single case, every single case, there had been a change in vision prior to getting the yips. Now, we found, also found out that occurs mostly between the age of 28 and 36 and 55 and 68. Okay? When you look down at the, at the pot or at the ball, there's a perceived line. But if your eyesight changes, this line will move to the left or it will move to the right, just depending on what your eyes do. Now, your eyes are telling you you're aimed perfect. So you make a good stroke and you miss it. Well, your eyes said you were perfect, so it must be the stroke. So what happens? You start to manipulate the butter. And that manipulation takes place over a period of weeks, months, sometimes even years, but eventually it's going to settle into the player's dominant hand, which for most of us is our right hand. If you have a player that comes out and you can see the yips, as I make a story, you see them yip it, take it out of their hand, put it in their left hand and have them putt, you will not see a yip. It'll be the most beautiful stroke you see. Then put it in the right hand. Have them putt. You'll see they'll almost fall down. Okay? They won't even come close to making these putts. So you've got to find a way to neutralize the dominant hand. What's the age? The age is uh, 28 to 36, 55 to 68. The first thing we do with the yipper, we put the left hand on the club. We take the right hand, we put it over the left hand, 
so that no part of this hand touches the butter. Now, when we do that, because we're expanding that hand, we're neutralizing this hand. Now we've got to get them to think of the putting stroke not as being this motion, but being this motion. And it takes a little while. But if, they, if you can neutralize that right hand, that dominant hand, pretty soon you're going to start to see some improvement there. Uh, another grip I use, I take the left hand, I take the right hand, put it between the two fingers of the left, and everything else the same. That neutralizes the right hand. And then, of course, you can go to your claw. Really good for that. Okay? But, Mentally, you have to get them to rethink the putting stroke as being this motion, not that motion. Right. Okay. Uh, now, what we're going to do, we're going to go outside. We're, I'm going to go through a lesson and let you guys see what, what I do and you'll see uh, what you need. You're probably going to need a laser and a backboard. And if you do, uh, right putting dynamics. Uh, right putting on Amazon.com. Uh, Rick Wright is right here. And he'll, if you have any questions on the backboard or the laser. Now, I do private schools. If you want to do a school for your members, you call me. I want to do a putting school. There are many ways we can do it. We do a one day school, we can do a two day school, we can do it for six people, we can do it for 12 people, we can do it for 24 people. Okay? Um, I charge $2,000 a day for that, and I will not do it at your club if you don't make at least $1,000 a day, okay? So when we set this up, I want you to be sure that you're going to make money on this. Otherwise, it's not good for you. Then, yeah? Just a quick question. This goes back to the faults and fixes. Have you ever seen or heard that in correlation between, and this is a not professionals, the correlation between Lord, yes. Okay. I had a poor player by the name of uh, Michael Thompson, okay, from Sea Island. Michael cuts every putt. I work with him, work with him. He will not change that out to end motion. You see him stand up into the shop, everything's out to end. And so, to me, hey, it's okay. Ball. Okay? To the ball. 
uh, perfect ratio, two point uh, two to one, or two point oh oh. So is that seventy six metronome measured from when the backswing starts to impact? Yeah, start of the backswing, back to impact. Starts on one beat, hits on the next. Mm -hmm. You have to anticipate that backswing because if you wait for it, you're back here and it beats again. So you got you know one, two, one, two, one, two. All right, well, let's go outside.